Hello, everyone, and welcome to this talk on model understanding for PyTorch and recommender systems. In the first part of the talk, I'd like to introduce a novel model interpretability library called Captum and show how you can use the library for different types of PyTorch models. The second part of the presentation, I'd like to walk you through a case study for recommender systems and show how the algorithms from Captum Library can help us to better understand our recommendation systems and also those, how those learnings can potentially help to improve our models. Lastly, I'll talk about the challenges and the future directions that we are taking for the library. So many of you have probably heard about different definitions of model interpretability. Uh, but for the scope of this presentation, let's define it as the ability to describe AI model internals and their predictions in human understandable terms. You might wonder why is model interpretability important and why do you care about it? It is important because it helps us to understand how our models make decisions it helps us to understand misclassifications. And lastly, the better we understand our models, the more likely it is that we will improve them. And thereof, more likely it is that we'll push the boundaries of cutting edge research. So how can we make a number of well-known interpretability algorithms accessible to all PyTorch model developers and available for most PyTorch models. To do so, we developed a library called Captum. Captum means comprehension in Latin, and the library has three core characteristics. The first one is the multimodality. This means that we can apply uh, the algorithms from Captum library to any type of PyTorch models, and also to inputs that are, uh, have different modalities, whether it's text, video, audio, um, image. The extensibility says that we can easily extend the library, add new algorithms and new features. And lastly, the library is easy to use. This means that we can use it with a couple lines of code and we can also visualize the insights learned about our models um, with a couple lines of code. So what does the Captain library offer? Captum Library offers a number of attribution algorithms that allow us to interpret the output predictions with respect to the inputs, the output predictions with respect to all hidden neurons in um, hidden layers, and the hidden neurons with respect to the inputs. The following diagram summarizes all algorithms that we have in Captum Library available. On the left side of the diagram, we can see the attribution algorithms that allow us to attribute the output prediction or internal hidden neurons to the inputs of the model. The ones on the right side of the diagram allow us to attribute the output prediction to internal hidden layers. The algorithms can be also categorized in two large groups. Uh, gradient perturbation-based approaches. So gradient uh, approaches are highlighted in orange, perturbation ones in green, and there are two algorithms that do not uh, belong to any of those groups and they are highlighted in blue. So within these algorithms, you might find some which are simple baselines, such as silency maps, input times, gradients, layer activation, or layer gradient time activations. There are a number of other algorithms that are more popular in uh, computer vision communities, such as guided gradcam, occlusion gradcam, deconvolution, or guided backprop. Although these algorithms are very popular in a computer vision community, they, our implementations are generic enough so that they can be applied to any model that meets the requirement for the algorithm. For example, for guided GradCam or GradCam, we uh, would like that the model belongs to a CNN family. There are a number of algorithms that use so-called baseline under ref or reference. 
Baseline is a um, very uh, well-known and important notion in the world of attributions, and I would like to spend a couple of minutes to describe it. So what is baseline? So in order to understand what, is, what characterizes the most certain object, we compare it with another object that lacks those um, characteristics. So baseline is based on th that same concept. So it helps us um, to blame certain parts of our input for our prediction based on of a comparison of our input with another input that lacks those characteristics that are important for our prediction. In case of image, let's say in this particular example, if we um, predict a dog and we attribute to dog, we want to know what is important for um, predicting a dog. So for that reason, we need another image where there is no dog. And we can take any other random image uh, or we can take this image and ablate a dog by replacing it with a rectangle and compare it with the uh, actual input. But one might think that this will create a baseline input that is out of our data distribution. To solve this problem, we can think of, um, instead of using this white rectangle, use a background. So the same concept applies also to text. We can compare our text with a sequence of uninformative tokens, or we can compare our text with another text where we perturbed or flipped uh, one of the tokens to see how important that token is for our prediction. In a general case, when we have any kind of numerical representations of our input features, um, as a baseline, we can think of um, ablating, removing those features by setting them zero to find out how important they are. However, zero uh, valued features aren't always uninformative. For some tasks, they can be very meaningful and informative. And we have to be very careful uh, when we choose the baseline value. This is one of the reasons why it is so difficult to choose the baseline. So we got to know overall what kind of algorithms we support and some get to know about some of those uh, well-known concepts and notions in, for attributions. Now let's see how we can use Captum library. So I, as I mentioned before, we have a number of algorithms that allow us to attribute the output predictions to the inputs. So those are the primary attribution algorithms or feature importance algorithms. And in this particular example, we have two targets, two output, target zero, target one. We have one hidden layer that has two neurons and we have three input features. To perform attribution, we choose an attribution algorithm. In this case, I chose integrated gradients or I imported from captum.attr package. I create an instance of integrated gradient by passing the forward function of my model and I define my input. In this case, I decided to use a random input. I call attribute on my attribution algorithm by passing the input and the target index of output that we, I would like to attribute to. So the returned attributions have the same shape as the input. They can be both positive, negative, or zero. Zero means that those Inputs do not contribute to the prediction. Positive means that those inputs are positively correlated with the prediction, and negative means that they are negatively correlated with the prediction. So in this particular case, I did not use baseline, although this algorithm does use baseline, and when there is no baseline specified, then all zero baseline is used. But we can choose to define also the baseline and pass it as an argument to our attribute method. The second group of algorithm that I mentioned was uh, the neuron attribution algorithm. So this algorithm allow us to attribute one of our internal neurons to the inputs. 
And one of such algorithm is neuron conductance. And I decided to use it in this example. To use it, we imported from Capdom ATTR uh, package. Neuron conductance is similar to integrated gradients. It uh, applies chain rule with respect to the hidden neuron. So we create an instance of neuron conductance, pass our model and um, hidden layer, in this case, linear layer. Then we define our input and we call attribute on attribution algorithm by passing our input and the neuron index that we would like to use for our attribution. The returned attribution, again, have the same shape as the inputs. Similar to previous case, they can be positive, negative, the magnitude of attribution score signifies the strength of the important signal for those features for that particular neuron. The third group of attribution algorithm is a layer attribution. So this allows us to attribute one of the output target to intermediate layer. In this case, we um, attribute target zero to our hidden linear layer. We chose here a layer conductance algorithm. Layer conductance is similar to neuron conductance that um, instead of uh, attributing to using one hidden neuron for attribution, it uses all hidden neurons for the attribution. And it allows us to attribute an output prediction to all neurons in the hidden layer. So in this case, we also uh, call attribute by passing by inputs and the target index. The returned attribution have the same shape as the output of the hidden linear layer. So in a general case, we can use all attribution algorithms from Captum package by using the same signature, creating an instance of attribution algorithm, passing forward function, calling attribute by passing inputs and any other necessary arguments for that algorithm, that this allows us to uh, compare attribution algorithms with each other and also switch from one approach to another. It's also important to mention that we scale these algorithms that we support data parallels and distributed data parallels. They help us to um, distribute the forward and backward passes on different GPUs. And we have the support um, also for neuron and layer attribution methods. Some of the attribution algorithms internally expand the inputs and this may lead to out of memory situations if we don't handle that correctly. So we uh, internally slice those expanded inputs into smaller pieces and perform the forward and backward passes on those pieces and ultimately aggregate the results. This helps us to avoid out of memory situations. In terms of perturbation algorithms, if we have enough memory available, we might prefer to perturb multiple features together. This will help us to improve the runtime performance of our algorithm. So I showed all um, different kinds of algorithm that we have in Captum library and how you can use it for small toy examples, but how we can actually use it for a real examples and how we can visualize attributions for complex models. So let's start with a computer vision example. Um, so I have here a ResN pre-trained ResNet 152 model and uh, we use uh, occlusion algorithm that is a perturbation algorithm to attribute to the dog prediction. And we can see on the right side that the input patches, pixel patches that correspond to the dog head turn green. So green meaning that there are importance in predicting the dog. Whereas the ones on the cat or some parts of a background turn red, meaning that they are negatively correlated with the dog class and the white means that those pixels do not contribute to prediction at all. So if we attribute to the cat, 
then we can see that the pixels on the dark turn red because they are contributing to a dark class and then pulling they are pulling away from the cat and the pixels on the cat head and body turn uh, green. So another example of uh, feature uh, ablation, here we uh, use a ResNet 18 model and bulk segmentation. So the segmentation will help us to segment our inputs into different groups, into segments that we will ablate together. In this case, we have three segments, bottles, monitor, and the background. And um, we perform feature ablation in this example and attribute to the monitor class. To, when we do so, we see that the pixels that are on the bottles are red. That means that they contribute to a different class and they pull away from the monitor class. The pixels on the monitor itself, because we attribute to monitor, are green, means those are the important pixels for predicting monitor. And the uh, pixels and the boundaries of a monitor are red. So these are the boundary uh, pixels that are separating our background from monitor. And there is a certain level of uncertainty. And um, therefore, we also have more red pixels. So I showed you a couple visualizations, but there were um, more static visualizations. So we decided to create a tool called Captum Insights that will help us to make those visualizations more interactive. And uh, this tool allows us to debug and understand model predictions and supports different types of PyTorch models and input features. Here is a screenshot of Captum Insights tool that was used to visualize the attributions for different images that were used in combination with a ResNet 15 model. Here we can see that uh, by using computer vision renderers, we can uh, visualize which pixels are more important in our prediction. We can do the similar experiment also for text. In this example, we trained a text classifier using IMDB, IMDB dataset and we can see which tokens are more important for uh, predicting a positive sentiment and which tokens are negatively correlated with a positive sentiment. So the, uh, the intensity of the color signifies the strength of the important signal for our prediction. So we can do similar experiment also for other models that are neither text nor image. And we created a three layer MLP model using Titanic dataset. And here uh, we visualize the important scores for predictions uh, for survival and the non-survival binary classification use case. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, multimodality is one of the main features of Captum library. And one of the well-known multimodal uh, models is visual question answering. Um, in this case, we can see uh, which modality is more important for our prediction, text or image. And we can also dig uh, deeper into a specific modality to understand which part of that modality is more important for our prediction. All right, so that was the first part of the presentation where I presented the Captum uh, library and show how we, we can use it. In this section of the presentation, I would like to walk you through a case study for deep learning recommender models, also known as DLRM models. So um, I will start from uh, representing the architecture of a DRM model and the data set that we use for our experiments. Then I'll show how to compute feature importances for both for sparse and dense features. Then how we compute the importances in the interaction layer, uh, move, moving to neuron importance 
and computing neural importance for the last fully connected layer. I'll also show how neuron importance based pruning can help uh, to improve the performance of uh, our DLRM model. So the data set used for our experiment was the crit Criteos traffic over a period of seven days. For uh, training, we used 39 million samples and for testing 3.2 mil million. The data set is highly unbalanced. We have only 27% clicks. And uh, the data set also represented through 26 sparse and 13 dense features. You might have already seen the DLRM architecture, but I would like to walk you through the architecture and the components that we would like to examine and put under the microscope during our uh, case study. So we have 13 dense features and 26 sparse features. And in order to avoid um, high dimensional representation of sparse features with one hot encodings, we um, represent them through embedding vectors using embedding tables. So this will, help us to, to get um, embedding vect vector per sparse feature leading to 26 embedding vectors, each having 16 dimensions. So these embedding vectors will be concatenated together with the transformed dense feature that was, uh, was uh, transformed in a way that is represented as one feature that has 16 dimensions. And in, a, as a, in the output of a concatenation, concatenated la layer, we'll have 27 features, each 16 dimensions. So these, these features, uh, will, we will then perform interaction for those features. So each feature, pairwise interactions using dot products. So when we perform that interaction, that will um, help us to get 27 times 13 interactions. And we will also concatenate this with um, 16 dimensions of a dense feature leading to 367 features or variables in the output of an interaction layer. This is then passed through an MLP module uh, that performs linear ReLU transformation. And lastly, in the last layer, uh, we pass it through a sigmoid transformation that will produce a score between zero and one, indicating whether the ad was clicked or not. So as first, we would like to understand the feature importances and we would attribute our output prediction click or non-click to our uh, dense features and to our embedding vectors. For this experiment, we use integrated gradient algorithm. So in this diagram, we can see the feature importances for five samples, five ads, that were predicted as clicks with a prediction score larger than 0 0.99. On the x-axis, we see the input features, the first 13 features are the dense features followed by 26 sparse features. Y-axis represent the attribution score. For each sample, we use a different color and uh, stacked those uh, contribution score for each sample uh, on top of each other. We can see that dense features contribute both um, to clicks um, and non-clicks, whereas the sparse features only have primarily positive contribution. So positive contribution means that those, um, that, uh, those features are positively correlated with clicks, click, and negative means that those features are correlated with non-clicks. 
So we can zoom into the sparse feature space and um, also look the attribution score distributions uh, for all dimensionalities. Um, so we can see that majority of sparse features have similar uh, distribution of attribution scores, uh, except that there are some outliers. In this experiment, we use um, 85 ads that were predicted as clicked with a prediction score larger than 0 0.999. So this diagram summarizes the important score for um, 85 samples that were predicted as ads with a high prediction score. And the important part of this um, is that we can see again how important are the sparse features are in predicting ads. Uh, at clicks and uh, and how um, how different um, are the contributions uh, of a dense feature? So dense features contribute both to click and non-click. So this experiment was for eighty-five samples that were predicted with high high prediction score as clicked. So now the question is, what will happen if we take random 85 samples. So in the next experiment, we took random 85 samples and only 13% of those uh, 85 samples were predicted as clicked. And we see how the distribution of important scores is changes, how the dense features become more prominent and how sparse features, the contribution of sparse features become smaller and smaller. This confirms how important is the uh, how important are the dense features for predicting non-click, non-clicks, because this particular sample set has majority non-clicks. So now let's increase our uh, sample size from 85 to 135K and see how the pattern changes. So we see similar pattern, again, for even for larger sample sizes, we still see that the dense features are contributing significantly to non-clicks. So since we know that um, DLRM model starts overfitting after the first epoch, so we decided to see how the feature importance score changes over the epochs. So um, for the same batch. So we see that the dense features haven't, don't change much. So their distributions is relatively remains the same, but we see that the sparse features, uh, the contributions and the patterns in the sparse features changes drastically from epoch to epoch. One might think that this uh, can be also associated with uh, or related to the fact of overfitting. This, of course, requires a much more thorough investigation and analysis. In the second part of our experiments, we attribute the output prediction, click or non-click, to the output of our interaction layer that contains 367 features. And um, in this experiment, we also used um, like layer conductance algorithm. So in, those, in this diagram, we see feature importances for 86 samples with prediction score larger than 0 0.9. As I explained before, the first 13 features are the dense features, and we again see how dense features contribute both to clicks and non-clicks. And um, from interaction variables, we can see that all interaction variables are primarily either contributing to clicks or have no contribution to the final prediction, which suggests that um, feature interactions either magnify the importance of uh, those features and support uh, the click predictions or they do not contribute to prediction at all. In the third part of our experiment, we uh, perform neuron uh, attribution and we take the last 256 neurons in the last MLP layer and we attribute them to input features. Those are the dense features and the um, sparse embeddings. 
In this experiment, we used neuron conductance algorithm. So in this diagram, we can see the neuron importance scores aggregated across 100 samples that were predicted as clicks with um, prediction score larger than 0 0.9. X-axis represents our 256 neurons in the last fully connected layer. Y-axis is the attribution scores. If we zoom into this diagram, we can see that for each sample, we stacked the attribution scores um, for each neuron, where the size of um, each rectangle corresponds to the magnitude of a contribution of that specific neuron for the prediction. So when we were conducting this experiment and analyzing the data, we noticed that out of this 256 neuron, 15% has only consistently negatively um, contributed to click prediction. That means that all that 15% neurons were consistently across all 100 samples were contributing to non-clicks. Another 15% did not con consistently across all samples did, did not contribute to prediction at all. And another 70% has either a mixed contribution or only positive contribution. So one might think that what will happen if we actually prune that 15% of um, those neurons. We might think that this might lead to increase of false positives because those are the neurons actually that contribute to non-clicks. But our true positives and uh, true positive might increase and false negatives might decrease. So this is a hypothesis that we want to test. And in our Next um, example, we basically prune that 15% neurons using neuron importance um, algorithm. And also in addition to that, we prune 15% randomly and also 15% based on the magnitude to see how do those other different pruning techniques perform compared to neuron importance pruning. Our ex experiments show that when we prune that 15% neurons, our true positive score increases by 7.1%, and that is 24, approximately 24,000 uh, ads. In contrary to that, random pruning leads to the reduction of um, true positives, leading to a um, reduction of a 4.8%, and magnitude leads to a reduction of our true positives by minus. 14.8%. So we look deeper into this in order to understand how other performance measures change. We see that for, um, for the pruning that was performed with neuron importance, our F1 score increased by 1% and recalled by 3%. So this is associated with the fact that our true positive increased and our false negatives decreased. Yet the precision decreased by 2%. This is associated with the fact that our false positive increased a tiny bit. But um, that in increase was, um, that increase of false positive was, wasn't as significant as our, um, decrease in the false negatives and increase in true positives. In contrary to neuron importance based pruning, magnitude and random uh, pruning lead to increase of our precision score, meaning that they, our false positives actually reduces. And uh, for weight magnitude based pruning leads to 3% improvement of our precision score. So this uh, leads someone to think that these different types of pruning um, techniques can help us actually to um, improve one or the other metric that is more necessary for our task. To summarize, 
Sparse features primarily contribute, we found out that sparse features primarily contribute to Cliff's predictions and thus that sparse feature importance patterns significantly fluctuate across epochs. That feature interactions result to features that primarily contribute to clicks or have no effect on the prediction. Neuron importance-based pruning can help us to increase our true positives, the harmonic mean and the recall scores and reduce false negatives. And that magnitude-based pruning can help us to reduce false positive scores and increase precision. As we saw, attributions can be very useful to understand our models and even improve them. However, they come also with some limitations. Attributions do not capture feature correlations or interactions. Finding good baselines is challenging and evaluating those different types of attribution algorithms and comparing them with each other is even harder. Attribution-based techniques also do not explain the model globally. So if we want a global view, then we need to aggregate um, sample-based results. We are currently expanding Captum beyond feature attribution by adding Captum.robust package that allows us to construct adversarial attacks against those models and study the connection between model robustness and interpretability. We also add a captum.metrics package that uh, contains sensitivity and infidelity metrics uh, that also allows us to measure the robustness of our attribution algorithms. Captum.concept that allows us to explain our models globally uh, using different uh, concepts and Captum.optim that uh, will start from uh, optimization-based visualizations. So this is all for this presentation. Thank you for listening to us and uh, let us know if you have any questions. Thank you.